This is a three-minute introduction to the audio-described version of Hannah Glass, Curry the India Way, presented by Northumberland Archives and the November Club. This film lasts ten minutes. Hannah Glass, a country gentlewoman of the 18th century, is in her sixties. She is sturdily built with wide, pale blue eyes. Her silver-blonde hair has been pinned up and mostly tucked inside a white mob cap perched at the back of her head, a few wispy curls left framing her face, along with a small pair of pearl and gold earrings. She carries herself upright, shoulders squared, and her movements are brisk and decisive. Hannah wears a rigid corseted bodice of forest green worsted with a subtle vertical bronze stripe, two lines of brocade along the fastening, and elbow-length sleeves. It is laced up the back. White muslin has been artfully draped and folded around the neckline as a modesty panel and pinned at the top centre of the corset with a round green and white cameo brooch. Her matching skirt is mostly covered with a pleated white apron and has a small bustle at the back. She stands in her kitchen, a large airy room with tiled walls, the bottom half emerald green and the top white. The floor is of large grey flagstones. There is a green painted door in the rear right corner and an inset window in the right hand wall, its frame and shutters painted in the same forest green shade. There is a striped jug full of wildflowers on the window sill, and above the door a white faced clock, the time in Roman numerals. Against the rear wall is an enormous oak dresser, easily three metres wide and almost the full height of the room. The top two shelves display decorative rows of prized plates and platters in blue and white Chinese or Delft ware and green and cream Staffordshire pottery. Below this, a line of cups or bowls is partially hidden by hanging bundles of herbs, feathery thyme, bristly rosemary, mauve-flowered marjoram and golden tansy. On the dresser's countertop, above the rows of drawers, stand a variety of stoneware jugs, baskets, a weighty mortar and pestle, and a set of weighing scales with brass weights. Set against the right wall is a deep, square, white ceramic sink. Mounted above it, a large, cage-like wooden rack for drying dishes. Blue and white striped tea towels hang beside it. In the middle of the room are a pair of long tables with smooth oak tops arranged in an L-shape, parallel to the rear and right-hand walls. These hold a number of small white china bowls, a copper pan and pitcher, and low rectangular baskets piled with produce, including peas, radishes, onions and bramley apples. On the corner where the tables meet is a small pile of books the topmost one, The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy, lying open. Northumberland Archives and the November Club present Curry the India Way. Hannah sits reading at the corner of the kitchen table. She looks up at us and smiles. Oh, hello. How marvellous to see you again. I am in some excitement, for I am making a special meal for my dear brother Lancelot, who is coming from Northumberland to visit me. I shall be giving him ice cream, which my confectioner has made. His boy brought it in its straw and ice box. It is waiting for the evening. You may never have heard of this dish, but there are very simple instructions in my book. She frowns. I have mentioned my book before, haven't I? There is a recipe in my fifth edition. I finished the work in it before I had to sell my copyright. And lowers her gaze. A terrible time in my life. My other two books have not been quite so successful, though they have sold well enough. One of them is all about confectionery. Do look out for it. She smiles brightly. Oh, but let us not dwell on sad thoughts. My recipe uses fresh apricots. Do speak to your ice man in good time and secure a large block for chipping off the shards of ice if you want to try making it yourself. Stands, book in hand. Oh, it is a most exciting dish and not much known here, so I think my dear brother will be very entertained. Facing us. Oh, I must let you into a little secret. Across the table. Lancelot is to become Sir Lancelot Allgood. King George III has done him this honour for his staunch support of the crown. I am quite proud of him. So, clasping her hands. Because it is such an important occasion, I have picked unusual and memorable dishes to celebrate it. 
I am certain that he will never have eaten ice cream. And I am even more certain that he will not have had my dish made in the India way. Now do not look so surprised. It is true that I always recommend using our own produce and in season. And so we should. A conspiratorial smile. But we would be foolish, would we not? To disregard the treasures of our colonies across the oceans. Why? Who could own a household without cloves and cinnamon to say nothing of nutmeg and sugar? I keep my most precious spices carefully sealed in dry containers. Some are quite expensive, so I'm careful not to waste any. Gestures a box. See here? On the dresser. I have them all in my spice box. My allspice, my mace, my nutmeg, my cloves and my cinnamon sticks. Take some water and pestle. The idea for this recipe was given to me by a person from the East India Company. And begins to grind. Who returned from India and became a customer of mine at my habit shop in Tavistock Street in London. You remember, don't you, that I was a maker of habits for the Prince of Wales? <laughs> yes. I have moved in very distinguished circles. I will, of course, be using ingredients from our own markets here in London, but I will also be using spices like pepper and coriander seeds. She pauses, looking up. You do not know coriander seeds. Here, look. Reaches for a bowl. The black ones are peppercorns. You must have seen those before. And the little pale ones are coriander seeds. These are from Egypt. Holds it to her face oh, and inhales. And the scent is marvellous. Puts down the bowl. Oh, I do wish you could be here to smell them. For this dish, I placed some seeds on a clean shovel and put it to the fire until they began to release their smell. Continues to grind. I have been beating them to a powder for my dish, which is called curry in the India way. They are almost ready. Stops, checks her book. I will be using the recipe from my first edition because it is the simplest. But later editions added more spices like Turmeric. Picks up a small dry root. Turmeric comes from India and looks a bit like a small ginger race. <laughs> if you want to use turmeric, then do. Puts it down. Cut it and beat it to a paste in your mortar. But beware. Your hands, your mortar and everything the turmeric touches will turn bright yellow. Yellower than saffron. And no soap can return them to their proper colour. Continues to crush the spices. Now for my curry. Puts them aside, takes a mixing bowl. Take two fowls or rabbits and cut them into small pieces. Filled with diced meat. Oh, that reminds me. I understand that some people believe I used the expression first catch your hair in my recipe for jugged hair. She leans on the table. That is nonsense. I wrote, take your hair when cased, not catched. That is to say skinned, as with rabbits. If you have your own estate and want to go catching rabbits and hares, as my brother himself might do, I wish you joy of it. But I purchased my rabbit at Smithfield Market this morning. <laughs> Picks up a large copper pan. Put your meat and scrapes the meat into it with a wooden spoon. She puts the bowl down. 30 peppercorns. Have a child help you count them out for a good lesson. She tips the peppercorns in. Three or four onions, cut fine. A bowl of thinly sliced onions is added to the pan and scraped clean. Some salt. A pinch of coarse white flakes and your beaten coriander seeds into a stew pan. Taps the mortar to shake out the last of the spices. With a pint of water. Poured from a copper pitcher. Let it stew softly until the meat is enough. She puts on the lid. When you are about to send it to table, put in a piece of butter the size of a large walnut. Shake it well together until it makes a smooth sauce. 
of a fine thickness. If it be too thick, you may add water, just a little, but the sauce should be thick, like beaten cream, not runny like thin gruel. Picks up the heavy pan in both hands, oh. moving it aside. I also have two recipes for an Indian pilau, if you were in the mood for learning new dishes with rice. Glancing at the book. And a marvellous recipe for an India pickle, which some call pakolilla. Returns to the table. It's a kind of rich pickle with cauliflower or green beans or white cabbage. It takes time. And it does use turmeric. A bowl of the golden sliced root. The taste is well worth you or your cook having yellow hands. It can be served with all manner of meats and pies. I shall offer some to my brother with cold beef and cheese. She smiles indulgently. Now. Spreads her hands. Do you not agree that this is a very special dinner to serve my brother? I think that food should be entertaining and stimulating to the senses, especially the sense of delight. She crosses to the window. I wonder if you would send me your special celebration dishes. What would you serve if your brother or your aunt or a much-loved grandparent were coming for a special occasion? Oh, do tell me and send me pictures of your delicious dishes. She smiles and picks up a tea towel to polish a fork. I have loved spending these little moments with you. Remember when we first met and I gave you my plague water recipe and saved your lives? A knife. And then we made mushroom ketchup together. I expect you're still using that. And a spoon. And now we are sharing special celebration food. She narrows her eyes thoughtfully. Will you do one last thing for me? When you are making a curry, whether mine or another recipe, will you think of my dear brother, Sir Lancelot, and give him a great huzzah? Grinning, she raises a fist. Will you? Thank you, my dear friends. Keep using the plague water and eating well. Goodbye. She looks down at the silver spoon in her hand, holds it up. Cocking an eyebrow. I wonder where that ice cream is. Turns her back and walks out of sight. Fade to black. To share your recipes or find other Hannah Glass activities, visit www.northumberlandarchives.com forward slash learn. Filmed on location at National Trust Wallington, Northumberland. Hannah Glass is played by Judy Earle, written by Fiona Ellis, directed by Cynthia Hardy, designed by Imogen Cloet. Music is Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 4, arranged by David Tobin, Jeff Meegan, Julian Gallant and Rob Kelly. Film production by Magnus Dennison, Katya Roberts, Adam Opie and Sel McLean for Meerkat Films. With thanks to National Trust Wallington, Ivan Day, Richard Archer, Martha Andrews, Pins Petals Powder and Fern Avenue Antiques. Produced by the November Club in collaboration with Northumberland Archives. Supported using public funding by Arts Council England. The audio description was by Jane Ensel for Vocalise.